when most people think about a haunted place, they imagine a house or abandoned building. But I believe that whole areas can be hotspots for paranormal activity. For me, it would be the land lying to the east of Snowflake, Arizona, and west of Concho, Arizona. Along the old Concho Highway, the landscape is that of red rock sandstone ridges and red sand. Ancient Anasazi ruins are numerous along the bluffs. Echoes of time when land wasn't so arid and dry, gnarled and twisted cedars dot the land along the large dry washes where sparse groves of cottonwoods grow. My grandparents owned 80 acres of land about 20 miles east of Snowflake. The locals in Snowflake refer to this area as out east. My grandparents' mobile home sat on top of a slow-rising hill. About a mile south at the bottom of the hill, my aunt and uncle had built a three-level home where they lived with their two sons and two daughters. The house was a neat layout. From the front, it only looked two stories, but at the back, and due to the slope of the hill, the basement was visible. A large wooden deck surrounded the middle section of the home. The home faced the west, and to the east, the hill slowly descended into a wash. From the back deck, there were views of the Zuni Holy Mountain and Little Colorado River Valley near St. John's, Arizona. This story is the account of the terrifying experience my older cousin Sam endured in the summer of 1991. It was late June. Sam was 17. While most people his age were enjoying their summer vacation, Sam was not. He had attended a huge graduation party and gotten drunk as a skunk. Unfortunately for him, the sheriff's department had also attended the party and he had received an underage consumption ticket, probation, a severe tongue lashing and a summer grounding. His mum even took the keys to his pickup he had worked all last summer to buy. There he was, stuck in the middle of the boonies. He had kept pretty busy though, helping out our grandparents who lived up on the hill. After coming home in the late afternoon, he noticed that their neighbour Jeff, from about five miles to the west, had stopped to visit with his dad. Bill. Jeff was one of those hippie guys. He was cool and all, but everyone suspected he probably partook in a little too much LSD in the 70s. Jeff had a place on top of the bluff, which ran adjacent to Stoddard's house. Bill and Jeff were on the porch bullshitting when Sam walked up. He said hello to Jeff, and Jeff asked him, if Sam would want to help him with a project on his property. He said he'd pay him a couple of hundred bucks for a week or two's worth of work, and Sam agreed. Some party money for when his parents left town next week for their trip to Nebraska with our grandparents. The next morning, Bill gave Sam his keys back so that he could drive over to Jeff's place. When he arrived, Jeff was loading up shovels and equipment into his truck. Sam hadn't asked what they were going to be doing, but assumed after seeing the shovels, they were probably going to be replacing fence posts. Jeff told him to hop into the truck, and they headed to the north, along the top of the bluff on a barely visible two-road dirt track. The top of the bluff had a good view of the surrounding area. You could see the outskirts of Snowflake, and the big dry wash dotted the cottonwoods to the west. The white mountains dominated the horizon to the south. To the north, 
mesas near Hellbrook were visible. To the east were a little valley along a smaller wash. He could make out the roof of Stoddard's house. Stoddard's house, the thought, sent a shiver down his spine and gave him goosebumps. He pushed the stories of what happened there to the back of his mind. They went around a small sandstone alcove, and Jeff stopped the truck. In front of them was a large ruin. Sam had grown up out east, and had seen many Anasazi ruins. It looked like a large pile of loose sandstone. But a closer look revealed pottery shards everywhere, like almost all of the ruins. This one had large holes where someone had used a backhoe to find pots at some time. Sam got an uneasy feeling. Jeff must have seen his face, because Sam said that he started explaining that his project was to excavate the ruin. He had a grand plan that he was going to excavate the ruin and open a museum on his property of whatever items they found. He'd charge people about five dollars to come and check it out. Sam argued that wasn't digging in ruins illegal, and Jeff told him, not if you own the property, it's on. Sam felt even more uncomfortable. What about angering spirits? Jeff laughed at this. Are you referring to Stoddard's place? Sam nodded. Don't get me wrong, Sam. Your aunt and grandma are nice, honest people. But I didn't think it was Indian spirits. I think they heard rumors in town about what happened to Stoddard, and they freaked themselves out. Besides, he said, this isn't a burial. There are no bodies here. Sam says now he should have listened to the feeling telling him to leave, but he said he brushed it off and started shoveling. Around noon, Jeff headed over to his house to make Sam and him some lunch. Sam stayed at the ruin. He said he didn't really think much about it at the time, but he noticed it was extremely silent around the ruin. There were no signs or sounds of birds, even no cicadas, which usually around this time of year never shut up. He said on the wind he swore he could hear faint voices but chalked it up to being freaked out by Stoddard's place, being only about a mile away. When Jeff returned with their sandwiches, he also brought a camera, so that they could document their progress and put the photos in the museum. Jeff had Sam take pictures of him in the room that they had cleared out and with the items. So they worked for a week. They weren't making much progress. They hadn't found a lot. A small pot, some beads, and half a matami. Sam was happy to have a day off. All during the week, he had fought the feeling that something bad was going to happen. He was glad to get away from the ruins for a while. He also hadn't been sleeping well. He dreamt one night that his bed had been shaking. After a pretty uneventful weekend, Sam returned to Jeff's house Monday morning. To his surprise, there was a backhoe parked in his driveway. Another neighbor had loaned it to Jeff. Jeff was excited because now they could make more progress. They made a lot of progress. They uncovered three to four rooms and found some more artifacts. Tuesday and Wednesday go by the same. More rooms, more artifacts, all the while snapping pictures. After filling four rolls of film, Jeff takes them to town to be developed. This was way before camera phones and digital cameras, where it took about 10 days to get your pictures developed, by the way. There was now Thursday. They had come across a pretty large room in the Pueblo. In the middle is a large block of sandstone. This piqued Jeff's curiosity. The rest of the sandstone they had come across was small. Using the backhoe, he moved the sandstone to the side. There was a black hole beneath. Something about that black hole 
made Sam's stomach numb. Jeff was extremely excited. He looked into the hole, but was unable to make anything out. He grabbed a flashlight and shined it into the hole. It's another room, Jeff exclaimed. Sam didn't want to look. Something about that opening made his skin crawl. Jeff told Sam to run and grab a ladder. He did as he was told, hoping Jeff wasn't going to ask him to go in there. Thunder rolled in the distance as he headed back to the ruin. Monsoon clouds were building up in the south, and the wind had picked up. Jeff put the ladder down into the opening. Sam asked him if it was safe, and Jeff figured that since the room had been filled with dirt and the giant slab of sandstone for a thousand years, he didn't reckon the roof would collapse now. Jeff descended the ladder with a flashlight. Holy shit, he heard Jeff exclaim. He called to Sam, who slowly made his way over. Bring the camera and come down. Sam felt terror grip him. He really didn't want to go back down there, but he also didn't want Jeff to think he was a chicken shit either. He grabbed the camera and descended into the black pit. At first, he couldn't see anything. It's black, very black. And then he saw the beam of Jeff's flashlight shining on a large corrugated pot. Even with the sunlight coming down the opening, it wasn't able to penetrate the darkness. Finally, it dawned upon Sam that the walls and floors were black, the air was stale, and it smelled strongly of soot. Jeff was excitedly moving around the room to see all the treasures it held. A long roll of thunder boomed in the distance. Start taking pictures, Jeff exclaimed, annoyed that Sam was just standing there. Make sure the flash is on. Sam began to snap photos. The flash illuminated the room briefly, and after about the third photo, Sam caught a glimpse of something that made him jump. A human skull. Heat pounding in his chest, he squeaked out, Jeff, there's a skull. Jeff, busily looking over there, didn't hear him. He snapped another photo just to be sure. Yup, definitely a skull. But he still didn't get hurt. So Sam said louder, Jeff, there's a skull. What? Oh yeah, a skull. There's a few of them down here. Looks like there was a fire in this room. He kicked one across the room towards Sam. And Sam jumped. What the hell, man? Sam said, his fear turning into anger. Dude, this isn't right. You shouldn't be messing with bodies. We need to call the cops or something. Jeff laughed. Call the cops? And tell them what? We found a bunch of thousand-year-old dead Indians? Sam was now really pissed. Listen, Jeff, if you want to mess around with this stuff, be my guest. I'm done. There's something bad about this place and I'm leaving. Again, Jeff laughed. You're scared of a bunch of bones? Whatever, man, go. I'm not paying your ass to be a crybaby. Sam tossed Jeff's camera to the ground and climbed up the ladder and Jeff started cussing at the broken camera. Sam didn't care, though he started walking back to Jeff's house, where his truck was parked. The wind was blowing pretty hard now. Black clouds covered the sun. Sam now saw flashes of lightning, along with the thunder. When he arrived home, he remembered that my aunt and uncle had left along with his sisters on their trip to Nebraska. His older brother Zach was also gone at work at Pizza Hut for the evening. He was tired. He lay down on the couch and fell asleep trying not to think about the black room full of bones. A loud crack of thunder shook the house, then jolted Sam awake. The house was dark. He followed his way to the light switch and flipped it on. Nothing. A flash of lightning illuminated the room. Damn, the storm must have knocked the power out. The wind was howling outside. He fumbled around in the closet until he found the lantern. 
and lit it. He still felt extremely creeped out, so he went up to his bedroom where he had a joint stashed. He figured if he smoked it, it would help with his nerves. His bedroom faces the driveway. He opens up his window and goes to light the joint. The flash of lightning and something darts across the driveway, and his heart skips a beat. The dogs start barking. He puts down the joint and closes the window. He feels terror gnawing at his gut. What the hell was that? He goes downstairs as a precaution and locks the front sliding door. He hears heavy footsteps running across the porch. Now he goes into full-on panic mode. Shit. The side door. He bolts across the living room, then trips over a chair. The dogs are freaking out, growling and barking. He catches a glimpse of something run by the living room window, illuminated by the flash of lightning. He gets to the door, fumbling at the lock. Whatever is outside has a hold of the knob. It starts to turn. He slams the dead bulk. Locked. Shit. The basement sliding glass door. He bolts down the stairs. He makes it to the door, finding it already locked. Phew. Another lightning bolt. In the flash, he sees the silhouette of what he thinks is a man, covered with fur, with a coyote skin draped over his head. Red eyes shining from the darkness where his face should be, standing at the edge of the yard. It's very tall. Looking into those red shining eyes, his breath caught in his throat. Panic wilds up in him. Scrabbling, he falls backwards, knocking his head on a table. Crying, he gets up to his feet and bolts upstairs to the phone. Call my mama. Call 911. His heart is hammering into his brain. He picks up the phone. Nothing. A large thud coming from the roof shakes him from his despair. The thing is on the roof. Shit. Gun. Gun. That comes to mind. He bolts to his parents' bedroom, where they keep a shotgun in the closet. The dogs bound in after him. It begins to start pouring rain. He can still hear the footsteps on the roof. He locks the door behind him. He's going into the closet, and the dogs follow him. He finds the shotgun, his hands shaking like crazy, and he loads it. The dogs are quiet. He can't hear anything coming from the roof anymore. Where the hell is it? In the house? He sits in the closet and waits. The dogs huddled around him. What seems like an hour passes, and nothing but the distant boom of thunder as the storm marches on. He begins to calm down a bit in shock. At this point, the storm has rolled to the north. Suddenly, he hears the door rattling. Bang, bang. It's beating on the door. Boom. The shotgun goes off, blowing a hole in the closet ceiling. And someone's screaming. Don't shoot! He hears his brother Zack scream. Tears run down Sam's face. He drops the gun and runs to the door, unlocking it, almost knocking over his brother. Zack is pissed. What the hell, man? Why are you shooting at me? Sam is in a daze. The story of what happened earlier in that day and this evening spews out of him. Zack listens, not saying a word. At the end, Zack asks him, Okay, Sam, what did you smoke? Nothing. I'm not high, bro. Zack laughs at him. Okay, but mum is going to be pissed. Not only because you blew a huge hole in their closet, but also all the mud tracks all over the place. You better get it cleaned up. What mud? And how did Zack get in? The house was locked. He asked Zack, and Zack tells him that the sliding glass door was wide open. The electricity had come back on at some point while he was in the closet. True to what Zack said, there were red mud bare footprints around the house. It wasn't him. 
he showed Zach his shoes, bare feet, and that the prints were way larger than his feet. David agreed. I bet it was Jeff, Zach concluded. He probably came over to mess with you because he's pissed you quit and busted his camera. He knew you were freaked out, so he thought he'd mess with you. Sam wasn't sure, but it made him feel slightly better. Yeah, he tells himself. Jeff, that asshole. I must not have got the latch to the sliding door closed. The noise on the roof must have been the wind blowing shingles off the roof. It began to all make sense. He and Zach drank a couple of beers that their dad had left in the fridge. They cleaned the mud to the best of their abilities. And after getting buzzed, they decided that they were going to go over in the morning and confront Jeff. Zach says he needed to pay Sam an extra since they now needed to rent a carpet shampooer to clean the mess that Jeff made. Finally, they decide to go into town. One of their friends is throwing a party. I don't think either one of them wanted to stay out there. The party is one that's out in the boonies, with a big bonfire. There are about 20 teens there. Sam is having a hard time enjoying the party. He keeps feeling like something is watching him. The beer isn't tasting good, and he's not really socializing with his friends. They ask him what's wrong, but he just says he's tired. The full moon is rising to the east, casting its eerie light in the sandstone bluffs and cedars. Sam gazes past the firelight and catches a glimpse of something moving just out of the reach of the firelight. It moves behind a bush. Must be someone peeing, he thinks to himself. But his gut is disagreeing. Suddenly a strange throaty howl pierces the light. Sam jumps. He looks around, but no one else seems to have heard anything. They continue laughing and talking. He now hears heaving footprints behind him. He turns to see a large figure of a man standing just outside the firelight. He is paralyzed with fear. The man's face is hidden in shadow, but Sam can feel his eyes piercing him. He closes his eyes and starts whispering a prayer under his breath. When he has the courage to open his eyes, the man is gone. He's pretty freaked out at this point and just wants to get out of there and he tells Zack he's going home. Zack decides to stay. Sam doesn't really want to go home and he also doesn't want to go back to the party. Mind racing, he heads down east to the old Concho Highway. Surely, he thinks to himself, he is just freaking himself out. Jeff came over and scared him, and that person at the party was probably just someone who was out there peeing. Yeah, makes sense. He notices something run across the highway. It's about 2am, so the highway is deserted. He slows down, thinking it must have been a deer. Crash. Something hits the back of his truck, jerking it forward. What the hell? He slams on the brakes, looking in the rearview mirror. He catches a glimpse of shining eyes. He is in full panic mode. He stomps on the gas. Sheer terror engulfs him. Too afraid to look back, he sees something out of the corner of his eye. He turns to look and sees a man running next to the truck. He looks at the speed. 70. He looks again. And now the coyote type creature is looking at him. At first, its face is shrouded in blackness, and then he said it transformed before his eyes. The only way he could describe it was that of a demon. Large red eyes and a twisted smile showing long, sharp teeth. It threw back its head and laughed. It took a long, clawed hand and scratched along the truck as it sped past and disappeared into the darkness. So this is what I remember. We lived about two hours away from Snowflake. I'm seven years old in my bed. At 3 a.m., our family is awakened by someone pounding on the door. Of course, this wakes up everyone, including us kids, as we watch that my dad opened the door to see my cousin Sam. 
he's white as a ghost, shaking and crying. My parents, pretty damn startled, trying to figure out what the hell is going on. He starts babbling about demons chasing him, and my mom sends us back to bed. The next day, my dad calls a Navajo friend, and they take him somewhere near Saunders to see a medicine man. After they return, Sam stayed with us until his parents returned from Nebraska. When he finally goes home, he never sees anything again. Years later, when I was older, and we became closer, I asked him what happened that night, the one that he'd shown up at the house, and he reluctantly told me. I later asked my parents about it, and they confirmed the same story he had told them, minus one final part. So the morning that Sam showed up at our house, Zach and his older brother went to Jeff's house to collect Sam's money. When he got there, Jeff wasn't there. Their door to the house was wide open. The inside was trashed. Furniture was overturned and broken. Jeff ended up being gone for about six months. Everyone wondered where he had gone to. No one really knew anything about his family, just that they were from the Midwest. At one point, my grandma filed a missing persons report with the sheriff's office, but later the sheriff informed her that Jeff was back east. When he does finally return, he is gaunt and looks like he's aged about 20 years. Everyone wonders if it was the drugs. Fast forward to five or six years, my grandparents invite Jeff to Thanksgiving at their home. Sam has graduated and long since moved away, but he is up for the Thanksgiving. Jeff asks Sam to come to his truck because he has something to show him. Sam agrees. Jeff hands him a stack of photos. They are the pictures they had taken while excavating the ruins. Sam flicks through, not really wanting to think of what happened back then. In the last few years, he convinced himself it was just a bunch of coincidences and he freaked himself out over them. Jeff unhappily tells Sam to look at the pictures closer. Sam does. At first, he doesn't notice anything. But then he notices in the shadows on the picture, there are figures, small, twisted, and evil, with the same face of the demon that was chasing him. Jeff apologizes to Sam, but he says that he had to make sure he wasn't crazy. He tells Sam that in the six months he was gone, he was hunted by this thing. It followed him all the way to Oklahoma. Finally, he sought the help of a medicine man. He returned the artifacts back to fill the ruin, and Sam said he didn't know what happened to the photos, and he didn't want to know. I worked at the County Historic Preservation in Southern Appalachia, working on buildings and properties the county owned. One of the benefits included with my job was living on site at one of the historic properties. The historic house was an imposing brick mansion built in the 1810s, and I lived in a small caretaker's house about 20 feet away. This was in the backwoods, so to deter trespassers and vandalism, the county had built an eight-foot-tall fence around the entire five-acre parcel and put barbed wire atop of the fence. I mention all of this just to show that it was basically impossible for anyone or anything to jump over or climb over the fencing and onto the property. One night after working late at another property, I pulled up to my entrance gate, let myself in, locked it behind me and then drove the 100 yards down to the gravel road to my house. There were no lights on the property, so I could only see by my headlights. As I turned my car around the corner of one of the outbuildings and parked it, my lights shone on a thing that I still have a hard time describing effectively. It was the size of a deer, but with long spindly legs and long shaggy hair. Almost like a taller manned wolf, if you've seen pictures of those. That alone shook me. There was no way that something of that size should have been able to get through or over my fencing. What follows is absolutely true. I got out my car to get a better look at what the hell the thing was 
And as I opened the door to go out, the thing took off running, not on four legs, but on two. I literally watched this thing raise its back up, stand at full height on its back legs and sprint away. I absolutely freaked out at that point, grabbed my mag light and my shotgun out from inside and tried to find the thing again. But there were no traces, no tracks, no anything. I have no idea how it got in or out of my property. I didn't sleep well that night. I just sat on my couch with my shotgun watching the front door hoping that whatever I saw didn't come back and burst in. I can't explain what the hell I saw that night, but it still raises the hair on my neck every time I think about it. I'm a 17 year old female, but only recently found out about these communities. I grew up watching ghost adventures and fact or fiction, paranormal files, all total BS, but it just goes to show that I've always been aware and interested in this stuff. But after hearing others' experiences, I figured I should share some of my own in hopes of getting any advice or answers as to what could be messing with me. I live in Florida and have always been aware of many Native American cultures, even though I'm not of heritage myself. Not sure if this is pertinent, but I timelined it and tried to write down everything I remembered about these experiences. It started from when I was very young, and the first instance of this happened when I was living with my grandmother. Her and I were very close. This will play a part later. You see, I was wide awake in bed, unable to sleep with her to my right. There was no doubt in my mind that she was deeply asleep only a few inches from me. Every television in the house was off and the only other person in the house was my grandfather who was asleep in his room. Then very clearly and loudly I hear my grandma call me from the kitchen. Almost how you'd be called for dinner. I know it's common to hear your name being called mistakenly, but I did more research on this as a teen. And apparently when you hear your name being called this loud, you're supposed to reject it, but I didn't. Not knowing this, I hustled closer to my grandmother and kept my eyes locked on the open door. The second instance was when I was around 13, when my father took me on a family trip to Las Vegas. We visited some part of the Grand Canyon, and while my family were waiting in line for a skywalk bridge we had paid a tour for, I wandered around the edge a good distance away from my family and decided to yell my name into the canyon to hear my echo. When it came back to me, it sounded distorted, and almost like grandmother had yelled my name back. It might have not been my grandmother exactly, but it sounded very similar. Nevertheless, just the fact that it was distorted was enough to scare me a little. I don't put too much weight into this experience, because it might have just been my voice being thrown weird. The next one happened when I was 13 or 14 as well, was the most terrifying one I've ever had happened. When I start telling this to people, I actually start tearing up. This is the closest I've ever been to whatever this thing was, and proved the point that it was mimicking the people I care about. I was on a vacation with my family to Key West, and had rented a home. I invited my best friend, who is called Ash, to stay with us. On the third day, we had decided to skip out on the boating trip and mooch off the house owner's Netflix all day. On the fifth episode of whatever we were watching, we decided to refill snacks and have a bathroom break. We pause the television and I make my way to the kitchen. I think Ash had followed me into the kitchen and when I leaned on the island while I was preparing some chips with my back turned to her, I held a full conversation with whatever that thing was and even looked back at her on her phone. I fully had no doubt in my mind that I was talking and looking at Ash on her phone. I turned my back for a split second to pick up the balls and suggest we head back to the couch. When I see Ash, or should I say, the real Ash, walk out the bathroom, which was a solid 30 feet away. My body immediately went cold and the first thing I asked her was how she got into the bathroom without me hearing. She then gave me the weirdest look 
and told me that she'd been in there the whole time since we got up. This is where I stopped freaking out and insisting that I had just been there speaking with her and physically saw her. She joked about doppelgangers and how maybe she was going to die. I quickly suggested we get out of the house and walk around the neighborhood. She then informed me she'd gotten her period while she was in the bathroom at the same time that I was talking to whatever I was talking to. We walked around until my mum came and she was back in the house. We're still best friends to this day and have been for 11 years and I asked her about it today before I decided to jot this all down and she said that she didn't hear me talking with anybody at all. Now at this point you guys must think I'm crazy, but for this next one I have a witness. I felt a little less crazy after it happened with people who freaked out as much as me. Again on this occasion, we were on vacation near the Great Smoky Mountains, just a little bit west of Sevierville, Tennessee. We had our previous reservations cancelled, so we took this little rundown cabin owned by a local woman, and we got there late at night. And the moment we all stepped out of the car, the first thing we heard was a man's voice saying, Hey neighbors, coming from a cabin to the left of ours that was higher up on the mountains where we were. We couldn't see the cabin really, just a road that led further up so we assumed he could see us but we couldn't see him. Probably some guy on his balcony. My friend's stepdad yelled, Hey! And we waved up towards the direction it came from. It wouldn't have been weird if it hadn't have happened every time we stepped out of the cabin or car. My family completely wrote it off as some type of hospitality. We were not used to it in Miami. Retelling it, my brother and my friends agreed it was strange. We did hear constant footsteps around the cabin at night, and some outside my window. It was a raised cabin, probably a story or two off the ground, but I didn't give it too much thought, since wildlife is a thing in the woods. Just something I thought I should mention. The thing that really propelled me into researching what the hell was happening to me was when I was having a photo shoot in the woods behind the cabin and both my brother and sister and I heard something calling my name deeper in the woods. Since I was with my younger siblings, I went into full big sister protection mode and almost threw them back down the little slope we had to climb to get into the woods. We were all crapping ourselves from how clear it was and how we all pinpointed it was coming from deeper in the woods and nowhere near the cabin. This was all during the day and we were all so thrown by this that we stayed in for the rest of our trip. We all agreed it was a woman's voice and the first thing I asked my mom when we got outside was, Did you call me? She had been lounging in her room with my stepdad all day, trusting that I would take care of the younger ones just outside the cabin. She saw how freaked out the kids were, and we didn't really go out at night for the rest of our trip. I think I reacted this badly to this one mostly, because I had kids to take care of, and I can tell they were terrified out there. Again, the voice sounded like someone was looking for me, or calling me back somewhere. With no knowledge of what this could have been, I had finally decided to look into things when I turned 17. I had no previous knowledge of wendigos or skinwalkers or anything cryptic, only crappy ghost investigations and Zach Baggins making something out of a scratchy EVP. I'm desperate for answers at this point because I'm constantly thinking about it and driving myself into rabbit holes of information and myths and legends. If you've heard this, thank you so much. I really would appreciate any input. Much love to anyone who wishes to help. The year was 1995. I had just graduated high school and an old friend who I hadn't spoken to in seven years now and I were hanging out. And we mutually agreed to go to New Orleans. And we did. We had $140 between us, and back then that was more than enough. We made it to New Orleans, almost died from culture shock, then turned around and headed to Magnolia to get some sleep. We stayed at Magnolia Inn. It was a dump, but it was nice and cool in May or June, and at that state at that time of year, cool was the only adjective that mattered. We stayed up that night playing poker, drinking Gordon's vodka, 
and talking about who knows what. Probably girls, college, then college girls. At some point I said, ever been to Texas? Nope. So we packed our bags and started to roll. We had a road atlas and Marshall, Texas was right across the border from Shreveport. We arrived in Shreveport, made a phone call to another friend who we were actually supposed to be staying with. Both of our mothers had called looking for us and the only person that knew where we were was the buddy on the phone. It was no big deal. We knew that we would be home in a day or so. I'm being short of details here because I don't want to turn this into a novel about chasing armadillos and being chased off by the bogeyman. Before I left the rest area in Shreveport, when we made the call, we saw an armadillo. Let me tell you something about armadillos. Those little dastardly creatures will hiss, jump, and turn into Tasmanian devils if you corner them. They also carry leprosy. We were 18 and chased the armadillo around for an hour. Now let me tell you about Shreveport. I don't know how it is now, but in the summer of 95 it looked and smelled like a place where oil and metal went to die. It was dirty and a crap hole. We crossed a bridge and saw people fishing a hundred yards from where a drainage pipe from a factory was spewing filth. The locals reminded me of locals in Adamsville. Bald-headed women and cross-eyed men. A lot of bald-headed, cross-eyed kids as well. I'm sorry, but to me it was a Rob Zombie movie come to life. I felt like my life was going to be over because I had a head full of hair and could see straight. The best part of Shreveport was an armadillo that might possibly have leprosy. And Marshall, Texas was 40 miles away, so we rolled on. Marshall was a decent little town, home of the Fire Amp Festival. We stopped at a little barbecue joint and had a coke, a smile, and some pulled pork. It was getting late, and the sun was setting. We looked at the map and decided to backtrack a bit, and headed up a rural route, 43, through Karnak and past Caddo Lake. We would eventually run to Highway 59, head to Texarkana, and then head back home. When we left the big barbecue joint and headed towards 43, it was dusk. Highway 43 wasn't well lit at all. My friend was driving and we were doing about 45. Any faster would have been reckless even for a couple of 18 year olds. This road was kind of like Christmasville Road. The non-locals just have to use your imagination. It was dark, winding, full of hills that ended in curves and there were beady glowing eyes on both sides of the road. You could hear crickets and the bullfrogs over the sound of the wind brushing by that old Sentra. It was peaceful and creepy at the same time. The humidity was a real thing, tangible. The air was thick. It smelled like pastures, hay, and swamp. We drove for what seemed like hours, and it was after midnight that I saw a sign that informed me that Bivens was the next town of any size. I was hypnotized by the yellow lines on the road. We hadn't seen another car in at least an hour. Sleepy, I rolled the window down and lit a cigarette. There was music coming from the radio, the tape player. It was either Tupac or Bob Sega. I smoked my cigarette and sat mindedly flicking ashes out the window. I took one last puff and flicked the camel shot off into the woods. And then I saw it. I never looked to my right. I didn't even kind of peek to the right. Maybe I did a little when I flicked the cigarette away, I don't know. But what I do know is that in my peripheral, there was something running alongside the car. It was just behind my window, behind where the edge of the door ends and before where the back window begins. I looked over at the speedometer, 40 miles an hour. I looked at my friend and he was looking straight ahead. I looked straight ahead. I could still see it. I could see one huge arm of matted hair of reddish brown, sticky looking and primal. I eased my right hand over and rolled up my window. My friend was still looking straight ahead, his jaw clenched, and he put both hands on the wheel. He sped up. No words were said. I looked straight ahead, and still out of my periphery I could see that arm moving, muscles and tendons visibly rippling beneath matted hair as the car gained a little speed, the thing running alongside us lost pace. Slightly. 
I then saw the hand at the end of the nightmarish arm. The hand was clenched into a fist the size of a cantaloupe, a big cantaloupe, and covered in the same hair but slightly darker around the fingers like it was stained with something. Suddenly the hand unclenched, and then I saw the claws, black as this damned after midnight Texas night. Those claws were at least two inches long, sharp like an animal's. This wasn't a hand so much as it was a killing paw, and the claws of some beast whose only purpose was to kill and eat. I looked back at my friend. I looked at the speedometer. Fifty miles an hour. I looked straight ahead, and it was still there. I lit another cigarette, didn't roll the window down, and simply said, Crap. The music had stopped. I finally broke the silence and said, Hey, do you... And before I could finish, my buddy said, I see it. I've been seeing it. I can't even see you, but I can see whatever the hell that thing is. How much do you see? More than I want to. Speed up, John. Just speed up. It can't keep up forever. I looked down at the speedometer. 55 miles an hour. Whatever was chasing us silently was starting to lag behind. I finally looked over to my right just a bit. Imagine the scary part of the movie where you put your hand up in front of your face but still peek through. In 37 years I have two regrets. One is picking up that first cigarette, and the other is me looking to my right that night. The beast was huge. Its chest was above the top of the car, and all I could see was that matted reddish-brown hair. Then it bent forward as it ran. I saw the face of this thing. All reality stopped. We were no longer driving down some country road in Texas. We were now trying to escape from the depths of a monster that inhabited hell. This thing's face is beyond my powers to describe. It was evil, the eyes were black, and the pupils were red. It flashed its teeth at me in a snarl, yellow and huge. Saliva dripped from its mouth. It opened its eyes wide, and it looked hungry and pissed off. Then it opened its mouth. The skin pulled back until all you could see were black gums and yellow teeth. Immediately I could feel the car accelerate. I just went. I prayed and cussed, lit a cigarette, and then like sunshine breaking through the clouds, the road straightened out. Don't you slow down. We drove through Bivens and drove through Texacana, and then we drove home. We never said a word. It was years later, eleven to be exact, before we even talked about it again, and we didn't even talk about it much. He said he'd never told anyone, and neither had I. I told the story a few years back for the first time while I was parked out on a gravel road doing the things you do when you're parked out on gravel roads with a good-looking woman. I told it a year or so ago to a couple of kids who wanted to hear a scary story while they sat around a campfire. They didn't sleep for a day or two, but they asked me a dozen more times to tell them the story. And I never told anyone until now that I saw its face. I'd been scared for my life exactly two times. Once was on that road, and the other was looking at a grizzly bear in front of me with a terminal velocity including drop to the other side of me. Call it what you will. Call it crap if you want to. But look me in the eyes and let me tell you this story, and you'll know. Never doubt there are things in this world that defy explanation and logic. The bogeyman is real. Some 16 or 17 years after this happened, I ran across a story and a movie called The Legend of Bogey Creek, Falky, Arkansas, where the aforementioned story and movie takes place. It isn't that far from Bivens, Texas as the crow flies. Invite me over, buy me a beer, sit on the porch with me, and I'll tell you the story of Rapaco Marlboros and a few of those beers. My dad once told me a story about a creature he once saw. Something I believe was a skinwalker. This was in the very early 80s, in late fall before I was born. My sister had come down from Toronto to visit with my parents. She left some time at a little after 9pm, but roughly seven-ish miles away from home, her car broke down. 
At least she broke down in front of a family friend's house and they said she could use their phone. She called dad and he came down and picked her up. The friend said that she could just leave her car in the driveway until the next day. She decided to stay at our parents for the night and head out in the morning. As they're coming back, it's now a little after 10 p.m. While driving through a particularly wooded spot, they hear a loud inhuman scream. It was so loud it drowned out the radio, the engine, and even their voices for the split second that it happened. That slammed on the brakes and they started freaking out, when suddenly something appeared at the edge of the car's lights on the side of the road. It was a coyote, at least seven feet tall, and was walking on its hind legs, and had a black and white striped tail. It walked across the road in front of their car, then once again it disappeared across the road, when they heard the scream again, only far louder than the first time. Safe to say, they got the hell out of there quickly. My family owns the farm in the heart of an Indian reservation. One winter, I was home from Christmas taking care of the farm while my parents were away Christmas shopping. As I was home by myself way late into the night, then I heard all of our cows freaking out. I knew it had to be wild dogs that are rampant in the area, so I threw on some boots, grab a shotgun and load it up, and head out to the field. This was a perfect scenario for a horror movie. It was cloudy, but there was a full moon, and it was breaking through the clouds, making it just right to light up all the snow. I ran out into the middle of the field, and just in time to see two giant dogs. They were standing up facing each other and fighting. I think perfect, two for one. So I pump a shell into the chamber of the MR-12, and then it happened. The two dogs heard the rack. They both stopped, looked over at me, and ran away on their hind legs. Immediately I froze, and every ghost story about skinwalkers and all the other Native American legends I grew up with flew through my mind. Keep in mind I'm a white guy, and up until then these were just boogeyman stories that all the native kids liked to tell us to scare us. That night, they became real to me. I was about 15 or 16, walking home from a friend's place at about 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning with the friend I was living with at the time. My mate was pushing a BMX and we were just talking and laughing as we walked home. All of a sudden we saw what looked like two very large greyhounds jump over a set of mailboxes at some flats and landed in the middle of the road. The mailboxes appeared to be one and a half meters tall and about five to six meters from the road, but at that moment I thought it was a little strange, but kept watching them. What I witnessed was something I will never forget in all my life. The two greyhounds, as they ran down the road, appeared to both stand up on their hind legs and morph into a much bigger, much beefier being, which I can only describe as looking like a yaoi, which I guess is the equivalent to a Sasquatch to our friends from America and other countries. These yaois both ran around the corner about 200 meters in the direction we came, and we both sat there dumbfounded. A few seconds later, we heard what sounded like a small female child scream in terror. Keep in mind it was around 3 a.m. in the morning, and there were no children out. We both looked at each other in horror, without saying a word, and I jumped on the handlebars of the bike, and he pedaled away, non-stop all the way home about two kilometers away. When we got home we locked the doors as we had no idea what we just saw. I asked him to describe what he had seen to me and I was in disbelief as he explained the exact same thing I witnessed. That is probably the scariest thing I've ever seen in my life. I've only told a few people about it and I don't think a single person has believed me. They all say Drugs, alcohol, blah, blah, blah. But how can two people have seen the exact same thing at the exact same time and it not be true?
My grandpa lived in Mighton, Utah, and he told stories about skinwalkers and how they could take the form of any animal or anyone you knew. I asked him one day, did you ever meet one? Yes, he replied solemnly. A long time ago, before you were ever born, before your mother was born, it was when I was young and foolish. I went to the valley of the skinwalkers. It's a valley where life never enters, not even the crows. The very guardians of death will not go there. They too fear the evil that lives there. He continued with his story. I went out there to show people that nothing evil existed in the valley, nothing but their fears. But I was wrong. He went on that he had gone to the Skimwalker Valley in his old red Ford truck to prove to everyone that they were what he thought they were. Just stories used to scare people. But when he reached the valley, the grass was black, as if it had been burnt and survived the fire. The trees looked dead, but were still alive, and he told me he saw a house not far from where he stood. It was old and the roof was caved in, the door was gone, and he walked towards it. There were strange markings on the side of the house, animal skeletons were thrown about the property, and it was as if it were a sacred burial ground. Then he heard his grandmother. She had died long ago, but he heard her voice. The spirits were calling for him, for his life, for his skin, and for his blood. They were the lost souls that could change forms from man to beast. They chased him, scared him, and told him that they would never forget him. Whenever I visited my grandpa, he would show me something that was brand new, but was broken the next day. These spirits would kill his animals, so he finally stopped keeping his dogs outside. It got to the point where I snapped at him, telling him the stories were lies. I told him, prove it. He turned around and pulled up his shirt. His back was full of claw marks, torn, wide open, scars from eons ago. I was scared and started to cry. She told my grandpa to put his shirt down, but he just stared out at the field across the road. She finally gave up and carried me inside, but as I looked over my mother's shoulder, I saw a large black dog yonder with white eyes watching Grandpa, as if it were watching him, waiting for it to attack. But it never did. My Grandpa died two months later. The doctor said his heart gave out, but I knew what really ended him. That was 42 years ago. No one has believed me, but it's true. So I will tell you, never look into a skinwalker's eyes. It won't forget you. If you do, sooner or later it will have you. You can fight and refuse. But if that's the case, then I hope you're not afraid to die. My mum and I were driving home after having dinner at our new property with friends and family. My aunt is in the front with us and we're following her home. She's doing the same since we live pretty close together and we reach a bend and my aunt slows down and her lights shine on a dog. I immediately recognize it is a dog and my mum goes, oh look it's cute. But it's taller than the average dog and very wide and not in an overfed way. Its hair is very long and matted, some pieces reaching the floor and it's jet black. Its face is huge, smiling with yellow eyes and the mouth ajar. I tell her before she finishes her sentence that it's not a dog, about three times in a row. She goes, yes it, then realizes it's not. Before she could tell me it was a dog, it stared at her right in the eyes, windows tinted up and all. She felt the same chill as I did when I originally saw it. After glancing at it at first, I no longer looked at it directly because I knew they hear what you think. Its gait was as if it were a human on all fours. It was extremely disproportionate and large. I've never seen fur that long on a dog. It looked as if the pelt was thrown on and hanging loosely. We get home and my aunt says she didn't even see it. 
we assumed she slowed down to look at it since my mom and aunt are very big animal lovers and are affectionate. We get inside and my aunt drives home. We discuss it and she agrees it was not a dog. I've experienced the same thing a few times before, but I believe once you know, you can always recognize them. <laughs>